Welcome everyone to another GBSN cross-border webinar. Today we have the era of Chinese multinationals competing for global dominance with Lourdes Casanova and Anne Miru. To begin, I will now hand it over to Lourdes. Good morning, Nicole, and good morning, everybody who has joined the webinar, both Anne Miru and myself, Lourdes Casanova, are in uh, the Margin Markets Institute at Cornell University. And today, we are going to share with you our findings that uh, we have had in the EMI report. The EMI report is, uh, may I, okay, you're, um, Nick, oh, okay, thank you, Nicole. Uh, now I have the control of the slides. So during, um, during the last four years, starting in 2016, the Institute has published a report about emerging multinationals. You have here in this slide the four uh, images of the four reports. And the first one was very telling because it's the uh, inauguration of the Panama Canal. At that time, in 2016, the biggest infrastructure war, uh, work in the world um, organized by a developing country, uh, managed by a developing country with companies from all over the world. And in the inauguration of the enlargement of the canal, the boat that uh, the ship that uh, crossed the canal first was a Chinese one. So it was very telling about China and Latin America, South-South trade, South-South investment, South-South cooperation. So based in these four reports, we published uh, this year the era of Chinese multinationals. Uh, we'll give you some data um, right now. And what is happening is that uh, obviously within uh, companies from emerging markets, China, China clearly leads the pack. It's, it's, we'll give you some data uh, related to that. Another uh, bottleneck that we found within uh, our work were data sources. So we listed here the data sources we have used. For the macro side, we have World Bank, IMF, UNCTAD, the former uh, home of uh, Anne, OECD. And then more and more, China publishes very updated data and very comprehensive. So we use the data published by MOFCOM, the statistical yearly report. But then at the micro level, not all databases cover um, China and Latin American markets and emerging markets well. So all have gaps, but we find that Capital IQ on the one hand and Bloomberg as well and FDI markets are the ones that cover them the most. Again, not all companies. Uh, Orbis, FactSet, and then the database that we found very comprehensive is Fortune Global 500 because it has a longitudinal data and, and is very useful for the comparison among the different years. And then last year we introduced in the report the Global Innovation Index because all the data that they have uh, regarding innovation. And as I said, then everything went to the book and I'll tell you in a minute more about the book. Uh, Nicole, I don't think I have the control of the slides. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so then this is the last report. Uh, the reports and we invite, we, we know that we have schools from all over the world and we invite other schools to join, to contact us if they would like to contribute with one uh, chapter from their own research on emerging multinationals. So uh, last year report, we had the era of Chinese multinationals, the same title as the book. Then um, we changed, we revi revised also the E20, what we call the 20 biggest emerging markets. That's the markets that the, uh, that the um, report focuses. And then the global south, what I was saying about Chinese investments in both Latin America and Africa. And the second part of the report, we always have 
um, invited scholars last year. It was pre uh, Wuhan crisis, so we had uh, Professor Limin Chen from Wuhan University. We have been in contact with uh, Professor uh, Limin Chen, and she has sent us a number of videos. And she uh, covered this uh, state capitalism or technology springboard where she covered Chinese multinationals. Then we had the privilege to have two uh, scholars from EGADE Tech de Monterrey, um, um, Evodio Kaltenecker and Miguel Montoya about Ch Mexican multinationals, social innovation, collaboration with Universidad de Los Andes, and then Korean multinationals, not from uh, a Korean uh, university, but from uh, also Latin American companies. And then this report is always published um, in collaboration with the OECD Development Center, with the Emerging Markets Network. We have a collaboration from the beginning in which we, they write for our report and we write for the Business Insights publication. So again, I use this moment, I know that we have uh, business schools from all over uh, the world to invite the scholars from those uh, schools to uh, write to us if you would like to collaborate with the EMI report. It's now published in eCommons of Cornell and also has an ISSN from the uh, Library of Congress. Next slide, please, Nicole. So today, um, Anne and I will cover the themes that uh, we uh, study in the book, that many of them come from the four-year study of the, uh, that we have done for the report. So the first one is that the global rise of Chinese firms has been rapid and dramatic. And I'll show you, I'll show you data. Nicole, please, next one. So the first uh, slide reminds all of us that uh, the rise of Chinese multinationals has gone hand in hand with the growth of the Chinese economy. So most companies all over the world grow with the growth of their own domestic uh, market, that is where they are born. That's the first thing to remember. And again, another data point I wanted to mention, <clears throat> sorry, is the fact that, yes, there is a lot of uh, discussion that the economic growth of uh, China will slow down. And definitely this year, for obvious reasons, for the pandemics, not clear, but uh, the, the original forecast was 5.9, 6%. In more recent, recent forecasts, move between 3% and 5%, which is still excellent if we compare the uh, growth forecast for Europe and from Spain, so Spain and, and Europe in general, or uh, US, where, uh, where uh, I teach at Cornell University. So it's still good, but definitely much less. However, if we uh, look at the value of 6% growth last year, or 10% growth, for instance, in 2010, 10 years ago, is still today's growth, as in a nominal basis, is higher than 10% growth of a smaller economy. For instance, last year, that uh, the economy of, the, of uh, China was 13 trillion, 6% growth, represented adding US dollars 780 billion. In 2010, an increase of 10% of an economy of 6 trillion was 600 billion. So everything in perspective, China's growth is still astonishing. And another data point of comparison, is to look at uh, US growth in 2004. So last year, China, uh, China's GDP nominal was the same as 2004 of the US. And that year was a great year for US economy and the economy grew 3.8. In comparison, last year, China grew, uh, grew um, 6%. 
So then I said economic growth. Another one is the scale of the, uh, of the Chinese economy. So the number of consumers is tremendous. And the last one is the capacity for absorb absorbing knowledge. And then one more uh, macro point that I wanted to mention is that the China has supported the OFDI in a very active way. So China is still an emerging market because the GDP per capita is still uh, the, the GDP per capita of a middle economy. So China was number two last year, eh, last year data with data of end of 2018, was number two as OFDI, a tremendous uh, achievement. But then if we look at 2010, was number five. So in the last 10 years, China, even before, but more aggressively the last 10 years, China has supported the uh, overseas expansion of their companies. Just uh, one comment for the graph uh, referring to 2018, 2000, uh, the, the data to 2018. You will not find the US because of President Trump uh, tax uh, rebates to companies repatriating benefits from uh, outside and that as a result the uh, the net was not uh, was negative or well basically zero because the repatriation was more than the uh, investments abroad next slide nicole please so as a result of these policies and if we look at the number of chinese companies in the global 500 last year in july we had 119 from China versus 121 from the US. So the number of Chinese big companies within Global 500 has been decreasing in the last 20 years. And last year, basically, the numbers were the same. A tremendous achievement for China with the current GDP per capita. And again, this is the result of a very active uh, policy in the country. Next slide, please. So this is a, a few countries are, so we have 20, uh, 200 countries in the world. So only 21 have more than one company in the global 500. So the number of companies correlates with the size of the economy, the GDP, and also the GDP per capita. So we expect to find the usual big company, big economy. So a correlation between big company, US, China, Japan, and the number of big companies. But clearly, China is an outlier. China has more companies that what would correspond to the size of the economy and the GDP per capita. We have other companies, South Korea is a still an emerging market or not, we still classify as emerging market, although many uh, of the organizations say no, many of the multilaterals. So again, another outlier by the size of the economy, by the size, even the GDP per capita, South Korea has more companies than it should correspond by the size of the economy. Another country that supports outward foreign, foreign direct investment very actively. And then we have other companies, other emerging markets that are where they should be by the size of the economy, Brazil with eight, India with seven, India should be a little bit higher, uh, Russia that we still put it as an emerging market with four in Mexico and then Saudi Arabia again. Uh, and then other countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Turkey and Poland with one. So we put in, uh, so the convention is E20, so the emerging markets in red, and the G7 countries in, uh, in blue. Next slide, please, Nicole. So another uh, data point that wanted to highlight is also the fact that in different industries, banks, engineering and construction, mining, insurance, Chinese companies are among the five biggest in the world. Again, this is um, by revenues and with global 500, Fortune Global 500 data. So in banks, 
you can see that four out of the five biggest banks are Chinese. ICBC, um, present currently in 47 countries and territories, China Construction Bank, Agricultural Bank of China, both uh, ICBC and Agricultural Bank of China, among with Alibaba, the biggest, uh, the biggest IPOs in the world ever, I still have the record, in Bank of China. Engineering and construction, any major const civil engineering construction uh, project in the world, you have Chinese companies as part of the consortium um, bidding in that, uh, in that auction. China State Construction, China Railway Engineering, China Railway Construction, etc. Because of the big uh, projects that they have done at home, they have the know-how and they have become also the biggest ones. Then also in uh, insurance, which is very interesting, a company that very few of you have ever heard is Ping An, a company that is using uh, data mining, artificial intelligence to be able to um, sort the, the, the claims, the, the insurance claims of any kind, car accidents, uh, problems at home, they are able to uh, process them in hours thanks to their investments they had in, um, in AI and in data analytics. And for um, the, the, the CEO, Jessica Tan, um, signed the preface for the book. Please, uh, next slide. Okay, so that is clear. They are big. They are, uh, the, the, the progression has been very big, very quick. And then they are different from Western counterparts. Next slide, uh, Nicole, please. So first, something that we know. Among the biggest companies from China, most of them are either state-owned or partially state-owned. ICBC, the, the bank, is one example of a mixed um, ownership between uh, state-owned and public. They are in the stock market. And if we compare to the US, and now the fall of the stock market is having a tremendous consequences in companies and individuals, because the power of the stock market, that's something we know in the US is tremendous. And 89%, so blue is US and red is China. So 89% of the big companies in the global 500 of those 121 companies are public they are in the stock market. And then a few that are private, and then uh, that's the composition. Only one, I believe, is the postal service of the US, is state-owned, and also we don't have this type of ownership that you also find in, in Europe where, uh, with uh, quite a few of the big telecoms, electricity companies, they still have kept, the, the government has kept a golden share. So still a bit of a control by the state, but in the US clearly, they, through a number of privatizations, big companies are all public in the stock markets. Next slide, please, Nicole. Okay, and another very interesting finding for us, and, and is a consequence of the type of ownership of Chinese companies, and also a consequence of China's strategy and the companies want to grow before increasing margins. So if we look again, the 121 US companies and the 119 Chinese companies in the Fortune Global 500, the margins, just dividing revenues by profits, the margins are double for the US companies than for the Chinese companies. Share, increasing shareholder value has been a mantra in the business schools, we teach about it, and has been, uh, has been a necessity, has been a priority for US companies. While Chinese companies, as I said, state owned, and also the strategy of the country has been first to grow, and then we'll, we'll, we'll find uh, increased profits. But for the moment, the profits are not a priority. 
and that way they are different from the US companies. Next slide, please, Nicole. And it's not that they break the rules of the game, but they play other rules of the game, and we are going to look at price and other variables. Next slide, Nicole. So the last three years in the, in the report, we have looked at uh, prices. In this slide, we present the prices of smartphones. But we have done, if you, if you download our report, we have done the same exercise the last uh, three years on different categories. And till now, in general, Chinese companies compete on price. They don't have global brands yet, except probably Huawei that not, uh, you know, they say sometimes bad publicity, any publicity is good. So Huawei now is becoming a household name all over the world. And also because Huawei has been very aggressive with uh, great uh, shops like what Apple has done. So Huawei in the airports, Middle East, Monterrey, Mexico, you land and you find wonderful shops from Huawei. So, uh, as I mentioned, they compete on price. And here we have, we compared the prices in the US, last year still Huawei uh, was selling in the US. This year we had to change because uh, the top of the line of Huawei is not sold in the US anymore. So we had to compare prices in Europe, um, in uh, China and in the US because of this fact. But until last year, Huawei was selling top of the line and the cheapest ones. So we compared prices. And show me Asus competing on price, LG, that is from Korea, as well. And Apple, Apple always highest prices. But we see this tendency changing and we see both Huawei and the Korean Samsung with top of the line phones. Right now they have launched um, folding phones that are very expensive. So now Samsung, Huawei are uh, household names and they can also go for the top of the line. But first they compete on price and it's still the case for phones like Xiaomi or ASOS. Another very interesting fact that is happening if we look at the, 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 the market share globally, this is global market share of smartphones. Smartphones is, uh, as you know, um, the smartphones are killing tablets. We use less and less tablets because the phones replace, the smartphones replace the function of a tablet. The new generation use more and more because they, they keep everything in the cloud and they use smartphones sometimes replacing uh, uh, laptops. And not, it's not the case yet, but definitely uh, part of the time they use them. So a very important product. And if we look at market share, we see that of the five biggest in the world, only one is American, Apple. The rest are Korean, Samsung, and Chinese, Huawei, Xiaomi, and Oppo. In spite of the trade war, Huawei in the last year has been gaining market share. And we were wondering why, because of course in the US has lost market share. And that's because the scale of the Chinese market, the scale of the Chinese market is so huge that we see a shift among Chinese consumers moving away from US brands to local brands because they believe quality wise are similar, cheaper prices in many cases, and also, uh, of course, because of the tensions uh, created by the US China trade war. So that's an interesting phenomenon. And as, 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 as I said, we found this phenomenon of Chinese companies competing in price in very highly technological products. Uh, happening across the, the across the different categories, like as I said, desktops, laptops, and others. And uh, one year also we compared prices of airlines, the same segment. We compared Delta, American Airlines, United, 
with uh, Chinese airlines and Chinese airlines, both in business and domestic, were offering cheap price, cheaper prices. Next slide, Nicole, please. Okay, they are also different. There is a lot of talk about the cost, the labor cost increasing in China. And here, what we did was to compare the price of labor, the price of um, gasoline, and the price of electricity in different countries. We use ILO uh, data for the price minimum wages, and also um, in, in, uh, in the energy um, agency for the other price, prices. And you can see that still minimum wages in China are relatively cheap compared to other countries like, of course, Germany, even Korea, US, and Japan. So the prices are cheap, but also are cheap at the top. So if you look at the median salary of a CEO of American five largest listed firms, the average salary is 13 million. If you look at the median salary of a CEO, there is a lot of variation, but there are many companies that are state owned among the biggest ones in the banks. So you can compare the, uh, the price of the CEO of JP Morgan with the price of the CEO of ICBC, of Bank of China, and you will be surprised by the tremendous differences. And again, there is a lot of variation in prices, uh, in, uh, salaries in, in China are catching up, and even sometimes the CEO has a lower salary, but those doing the investment banking side will have higher salaries. But definitely, on the average, both at the top and at the bottom, definitely the costs of China, production of Chinese farms are still quite cheap. Definitely, there is going to be uh, moving uh, manufacturing facilities and others to other countries because of a number of reasons, because you need uh, global value chains that are more uh, flexible, but definitely the costs are still cheap. And um, maybe because of time, I'll, I'll move on, but definitely we can, in the discussion, maybe talk more about this slide. Next slide, Nicole. Yeah, and then another thing that is happening, and you can talk about the quality of the patents, you can talk about the quality of, of other uh, indicators, but China uh, is investing a lot in R&D, and look at the expenditures, and also the number of researchers, and as I said, patents, and also scientific and technological publications that are definitely China is becoming a leader also in innovation. Next slide, please. And as a consequence, and going back to the discussion about the smartphones, brands still a deficit for Chinese companies. Chinese uh, don't have global brands in many industries even insurance, what I mentioned before, Ping An, uh, no one or, or very few outside China know the company that is again the biggest and very innovative. But then we see other brands, Tencent, WeChat, not that well known, but still you enter WeChat and many of your friends will be in WeChat. You enter, uh, definitely you buy a Huawei and globally Huawei Europe Middle East again, Latin America is recognized as a good brand. So we see if we look at brand Z or brand directory, we see still a tremendous deficit if we compare with the number of big companies, still global brands definitely are European and, and American. Uh, the recognition is much, much more than the Chinese firms, but Chinese firms are growing in terms uh, in those rankings. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'll pass now uh, to Anne, who, will, who is joining us from Switzerland. Anne, please. Yes, good, uh, I should say, I suppose, good morning, everybody in the US. So I am based in, uh, in Geneva. I'm very happy to be able to present you some of uh, the uh, conclusions or uh, constatations that we, we came, that we got out of our, our analysis. So yes, indeed, I think it's very important, the last point that uh, Lourdes mentioned is the fact that uh, Chinese companies have become fa uh, formidable competitors because eventually they mixed up the price advantage in a way 
with the uh, increasing innovative product and brand recognition. And with these three parameters, basically, because of that, they are really becoming uh, competitors and a threat, which is much more vital than it used to be, let's say, 10 years ago. And it's definitely, I suppose, an area for further research. So I will continue with, uh, basically, um, the ex outward expansion of Chinese firm, uh, both through Greenfield project and uh, merger and acquisition. So I'm trying to move, but ah oh yes, here it is. So uh, basically, in the report, we we have analyzed, uh, we have used uh, data from FDI markets, very good source of data because it gives information about the announced project uh, that the company have uh, made uh, public. Uh, you may have a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the quality of the data. We think they are very representative of what's going on. And by the way, we are pretty sure that we are going to see for the first half of 2020 a big drop, actually. The same way uh, is taking place in merger and acquisition. And as you can see here, it's very, uh, basically, it, it's very telling. It goes, it converges with what Lourdes has uh, showed, which is basically, China, again, over the year, increasing its outward expansion. Um, and you, you can see that among the other, other emerging markets or so-called emerging markets, I would say South Korea is also a very good contender, but beyond that, there is not that much. So the position of China in the group of emerging economy is very, very special. We also considered, and I will try to go through to the next slide. Yes, oh. moving very, very fast. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to go down uh, on the left. I'm sorry for that. Um, here it is. Okay, this is a slide that I wanted to show you. It's basically, um, Chinese company, especially after the global financial crisis, have uh, used the merger and acquisition as a way of entering uh, uh, foreign markets. And actually, if we look at the data, there is a real turning point in the aftermath uh, of the crisis. And it will be very interesting to see whether the present case crisis that we are going through, what, how is the whole landscape of foreign direct investment going to evolve? So we look at that, and one of the things that we wanted to flag is actually one of the reasons which, I mean, the, perhaps the most, the main target for uh, outward uh, merger and acquisition for Chinese company is de facto Europe. For a number of reasons, one of them being, of course, that a lot of European companies were weakened by the global financial crisis, but also because they have companies to, to sell. And in the sectors which are particularly targeted are definitely technology-oriented sector and the consumer market sector. And in technology, for instance, the situation in Germany, but also in Switzerland, where I am living, is very, very interesting because the acquisitions are not necessarily very big companies, but niche, uh, basically niche industry, niche sectors. And as you can see, the graph is very telling because the, uh, uh, very, the brown red is after the crisis and the pale red is before the crisis and you see the situation of uh, Europe which is definitely above all others. Next, I'll try to go. Okay, and we looked, we consider also, and I will go through that a little bit uh, quickly in, in a way, but what we wanted to show is that uh, uh, it used to be the case that uh, you know, Western or traditional uh, uh, multinational company from the US or, uh, or, uh, or Europe, uh, the main objective, the main motivation was efficiency uh, seeking, in addition, of course, to natural resources seeking. But in the case of uh, a Chinese company, the prime motivation initially was natural resource seeking and not so much market because largely the market is there in Asia and especially in China. But together now, you, in addition to natural, 
natural resources, motivation, you have obviously the knowledge seeking and knowledge in its broad sense. I mean, not only IT, but a lot of uh, other elements around, uh, uh, around technology. So uh, I th it's basically, it's a characteristic, if we could say, of the expansion of uh, Chinese multinational co uh, corporation, which is not necessarily uh, it used to be the case that you would go uh, abroad and uh, expand in foreign markets once you have accumulated a number of competencies which provide you the necessary um, background to be a good competitor abroad. Chinese company not necessarily. Sometimes they go abroad, they try, it works, yes, it does not work too bad, will uh, go somewhere else. So there is a lot of learning by doing and at the same time uh, the the size of the magnitude of the investment is such that definitely it's kind of blazing, if you want, the whole landscape that, that we know. I will now go into in, um, when we began working on emerging market multinationals, you know, we had in mind to uh, consider, I would say, all region of the world. But we were struck by the fact that the China in itself is an animal. It's, it's very special. And even some people could say, is it really nowadays an emerging economy? It's a big question mark. Anyway, we have in our studies in the report, but also in the book that Lourdes mentioned a moment ago, we uh, zoomed on four Chinese companies, which are uh, particularly illustrative of the situation. I will zoom on two of them, actually, State Grid and Hainan Airline. But ICBC, biggest bank in the world, Lourdes mentioned it, and Tencent also, which is the third company in this slide, is uh, uh, companies that now increasingly number of people begin to know all over the world. It's an interesting company because it's an innovative tech giant. It's an, really one of the number one in the video game, but not only, it also has expanded in other areas. And what is also very interesting or kind of funny to, say, to, to see is that uh, for instance in the video game, a number of the most famous game in the world are actually owned by Tencent, but the, the players do not necessarily uh, know it. And Tencent is now, I think, number uh, 20 or, uh, no, 200, number 230 something is a global 500. It's a relatively uh, young company. But as I said, I wanted to zoom on two of them. The first one is State Grid, because this company is one of these, uh, um, oh, again, is one of these uh, monsters in a way, uh, Chinese monsters that are not well known. But State Grid here, this uh, slide, I don't know if, you know, it's difficult to do because it's, we are having this remote presentation, but I'm not sure that many people know about State Big Corporation of China, but it's the number one electricity company in the world. We have in this slide, we have indicated the fourth largest, says grid number one, then Enel, the French EDL and the Japanese Telco. And below you see their total revenue. And then you can already get a grasp of the difference of the size because you have 347 billion for state grid and the next one in line is NL with 85. So it's an extremely powerful company in terms of financial uh, basically uh, income. But also in terms of technology, it's a company which has invested a lot of technology and it's a pioneer in ultra high voltage technology. So it's also an example of a state-owned company which has also managed to be a very good in terms of technology. So we wanted to highlight that one. And the other one I wanted to highlight is a slide before, so I don't know if I will be able up again. Uh, yep, is H&A. And the reason why I want to highlight it is that uh, in a way Chinese firm or multinational, they, they, they they are like the others uh, foreign investors. I mean, they are prone to accidents in life. And that's what has been happening to HNA, uh, HNA being Hainan Airlines. It's a company who had a meteoric rise uh, in about eight years. 
It entered the Fortune Global 500 in 2014 or 2015, at the bottom, number 400 something, but he had done very well between uh, in, in the early years of the 2000s. But it's a company which basically, for some reason, went in a buying spree, uh, which makes sense in terms of diversification, but perhaps went a little too far. And the buying spree was highly leveraged. And that company was squeezed when, in China, the government be began to be very suspicious of uh, Chinese investors abroad. There was this fear of a capital flight. So the government uh, began to be very stringent and the financier in financiers in China begin to be a little more reluctant to go on lending. So they, they, you had this first uh, uh, element, which was very um, defavorable to Hainan Airlines. The second element is also very important because at the same time that happened in China, abroad, a number of countries began to be a little bit, you know, reluctant or began to scrutinize these uh, Chinese investors or acquirers. So HNA was taken between these uh, various forces and went into serious financial trouble, troubles. They began in 2017. The company which had managed to build an empire between, let's say, the 2000 and 2015 saw the majority of its empire disappear in a matter of two years, between 2017 and 2019, because they had to sell and sell and sell because of that financial trouble. So it's an interesting case. It means that not a Chinese firm uh, depend, independently of their size can um, resist uh, accidents in life. That's the first thing. Now, I would like to, to add a word before concluding on basically, because we, we, when we were doing this presentation, you know, the, in February, the global landscape was completely different. So at the time, you know, we could really think about what should we do and what can we do? And there is a lot to learn actually uh, from uh, the Chinese multinational. Uh, the, so I will, I will first quickly go through that. There is basically four conclusions. The first one is that Chinese firms, at least those we have uh, worked on, have a longer uh, perspective than perhaps uh, uh, Western uh, firms for a number of reasons, one of them being the mode of financing and less reliance on stock markets. Uh, the second uh, conclusion is that competitions can be continues to be uh, very important, but it's mixing up with uh, branding and innovation so that they become very, very serious competitors. And the last conclusion is that it's an opportunity also to learn because to some extent it may be another mindset in business, which is also always very interesting in our view to continue exploring. So that is the key message as they stand in February 2020. Now, two months later, we are in the midst of a major crisis. And of course, the big question is that we will want, what will be the impact on the Chinese economy and what will be the impact of the Chinese firms? I mean, I won't be presumptuous because I don't have the answer and I'm not sure anybody has the answer. Lord Des mentioned a decline in the GDP ratio, yes. Uh, many people say that uh, China may not go beyond 4% in annual GDP growth, which is quite a fall compared to five or six, seven years ago. But most likely might be better than many other economies in the world. So we always have to keep in mind that everything is relative. And the other point is that what will be the impact of the Chinese company? Uh, because on the one hand, there is all the, the exports, the export side, which is basically tumbling from the right now. And uh, we have learned very recently that about 500,000 firms have uh, closed in China uh, during the first quarter of 2020. So you have the normal closure, but this is really beyond the, the, the normal situation. So you have this first one, the, the exports, um, which is going to affect 
definitely a number of companies. So you, you have impact on the global value chain, but at the same time, you still have a very strong domestic market. So what is going to balance more? What is going to be to offset? You know, is the Chinese domestic economy being in such a state that the domestic market will this time offset what is happening abroad? As of now, we don't really know. So it's a very interesting question. And the other question I think which is worth exploring is of course the impact by sector. For instance, it's very interesting to see that uh, even a company from Tencent, uh, which is a lot uh, focusing on video game, on the one side is gaining in terms of its uh, part of the business, which is related to video game and all that kind of activity on, the, on your computer. But on the other end, know that uh, you know, they have also issued a little bit of warning because they, in terms of uh, basically uh, advertising and also mobile payment, they have much less activity over there. So we will also have to look at by sector, what is the eventual outcome? It's a little bit early, uh, early because the crisis has not yet fully unfolded and the, what is happening in the global economy in the world obviously is going to determine, in my view, uh, the, uh, the way the Chinese economy will evolve and also what's going to happen to the Chinese multinationals. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Lourdes and Anne. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left for um, some questions and answers. Um, so if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button on your tool tab and submit uh, the question um, via the box and which we will answer live right now um, with the presenters. All participants will receive the recording um, of the webinar, uh, Following, um, following today and in a few days, the recording of the webinar, as well as uh, the Q&A report. Um, so uh, you will all receive that. So let's see if we have any questions coming in here. Uh, while we wait for questions to come in, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that our next cross-border webinar um, titled Locking in Jobs in a Lockdown, Coronavirus and Careers for Business Graduates will take place on Thursday, April 16th at 8 a.m. Um, please uh, visit the GBSN website for registration information. Well, looks like we don't have um, any questions. Mm -hmm. So I guess they covered a lot of things um, within their presentation. Um, I will also include links to both Anne um, and Lourdes's uh, LinkedIn profiles in the emails. Oh. Sorry, I'm, we, we do have one coming in. So from Geetha, what is the role of the Chinese government policy, Belt and Road Initiative, in the rise of Chinese m and &Es? Oh, Lourdes, I think you're yeah, on. Yeah, 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 I know. I, uh, I st I'll start covering that and maybe Anne wants to add something else. So um, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, so a couple of things. One, if you look at the overall uh, investments abroad of China, if you look at the overall OFDI data, the first target is Asia, which is normal because it's the backyard of China. So Ch China is investing a lot from Mongolia to, Com to Cambodia, to Vietnam, to India, in spite of the, of the rivalry that the both countries have and the disputes. So Japan, uh, trade between Japan and, Ch and China is, is, is huge. So then um, that's number one. And then with the Belt and Road, and Road Initiative, the idea of China is, some they call it the Marshall Plan of China. So the idea is to cover a group of nations that with tremendous needs in infrastructure, both digital and, and, and real infrastructure of construction of bridges and trains, and, et cetera, and say, okay, we are going to focus on this area. And the reality is five years later, so last year was this year, six years that the, the agreement was signed, the Belt and Road Initiative, is that investments in the area have grown in just five years 50 percent 
however, from a very, very low uh, point. Uh, definitely, and I see the second question, definitely the, the, the second, um, the second uh, criticism that they have is that, okay, then companies from China will be the ones building the bridges, um, Huawei will be doing the 5G, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, of course, normally when, because the, the, the investments are not only investments, but are also loans and uh, help with the development of the country. So then, yes, the, the China also creates its own ecosystem of banks giving the loans and their own companies, along with local companies, uh, doing the projects. And that's the reality. And yeah, maybe, Anne, you want to add something else? Yes, basically, as, as Lourdes said, the, 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 the Chinese government policies have been instrumental in the, the expansion of Chinese firm abroad. Uh, because since the late, in the early 90s, basically, no firm could invest abroad. No, the firms from China could invest abroad. There, was a, there were a little bit of, you know, some exceptions everything under the Chinese government, but it was almost impossible. I mean, highly restricted. And progressively, they went, you know, from they lifted the restriction and then they liberalized. And the third step is they have been actively supporting outward expansion. And this is a very uh, specific situation among emerging economies. Very few countries are supporting the foreign investment of their do domestic companies. There is only China and of the same magnitude of support, I would say Korea. But none of the others basically are supporting. And even in the globe, actually, uh, China is very, very special in that sense. So the role of the government has been instrumental. And interestingly, when the government began to squeeze a little or to be a little more worried of what's being done, immediately you see an impact on uh, the outward investment of Chinese firm. That being said, uh, it has continued very, very to increase uh, substantially. But definitely the government has a say in, the, in uh, limiting or favor, um, encouraging access to finance and in uh, basically setting up very, very clear regulations that com all companies, private or state owned, have to follow. Okay, I see more questions. So one regarding profits, uh, profit margins. So the question is, do, uh, so are Chinese companies in lower margin industries? So let me answer this one, it's very easy. So uh, a couple of things. One, we did the, um, the comparison in different industries and then look at that. So look at the, again, with global 500, uh, data with Fortune Global 500 data. And then what we found, not last year, but the previous years, is that, for instance, Chinese banks had bigger margins than US banks, which was interesting. Not last year, because last year, because of the performance of the stock market that was so strong, the uh, profits of US banks went up. So then, uh, yes, we see this across the board in all industries except for the banking industries, banking industry where the Chinese banks are very profitable at par, if not more than the US banks. So no, this is, res this is responding more to a policy of these companies and policy of the country to go long term. Another question refers to the, um, to the how confident we are on the data. Um, the, uh, some of the data, as I told you, comes from Fortune Global 500. So this is data disclosed by the U.S. companies, the ones that are only state-owned. Of course, you have to rely on what the company says. The ones that are public do have to follow the, uh, the disclosure uh, agreements regarding salaries and regarding uh, regarding uh, margins and profits and everything. Uh, you have to agree with that. Yes, we, ha we have found, uh, we looked at, uh, we have um, micro data regarding greenfield investments by FDI markets. If we compare that with the data uh, released by the MOFCOM, 
Mofcom gives the, the list of companies from China that invest the most abroad. And yes, there is a correlation, but not much. So yes, data is always complicated to get from emerging markets. Many companies are doing their very best to update it, both you know, in the China and also the companies that release data. So we are confident that with some, uh, the data that we uh, have, it gives an overall picture. Okay, and then, uh, okay, many more questions. Very quickly, and do you see the questions, Anne? And maybe- oh, I don't see them. them. I don't okay. see them, that's why I'm- asking. Okay, so, okay. so then let me just uh, quickly go, because we have just four times, and four minutes, and the, some of the questions are very interesting. So what do we see about the US administration trade dispute with China, and how it's affecting this, the strategy of Chinese firms? Okay, so two things. One surprise for us was how important the US was for the Chinese uh, companies. So yes, Europe as a region is more, uh, the volume of M&A activity is bigger in Europe than in US, but if we look at individual countries, US is number one. So for any global company, the, the US market is the most important one, the purchasing power, the dynamism, the knowledge. So yes, Chinese companies are facing a lot of scrutiny and CFUs, the regulatory body of, uh, and, and they feel also the same scrutiny in Europe, not only in US, but also in Europe. And yes, in the US is big this, uh, and uh, yes, we see that the M&A activity in US is going down, but uh, Chinese companies, my opinion, will find other ways and US will continue to be very attractive for them. Uh, sectoral pri uh, priorities, yes, we see also, we have in 2017 and 2018 reports, we looked at the phases of Chinese expansion abroad, and as Anne said, follows the government regulations. So the, the government says, go out, companies go out. The government says, please uh, um, stop investments in real estate because that was a way to sometimes believe to, uh, so it was not clear if it was corruption or what was it. So then they stopped the investments in real estate and went as um, um, unsaid in technology and others. Okay, let me just see. We have two minutes, uh, Nicole, and I know that the webinar will be in two minutes. Yes. So, uh, so then uh, a couple of things. Um, yeah, okay, talent for Chinese companies. China, uh, the Chigite, I'll answer um, separately if you want. Uh, Dan, thank you for your question about talent. China had a very aggressive program to attract talent from outside for the Chinese diaspora, organizes days of where they get all the Chinese diaspora in Beijing, where the government explains their plans and the companies come and say about that. And definitely that has been extremely beneficial for uh, Chinese companies that uh, attracting the uh, global talent. So there was a little bit of cultural heritage and at the same time, a very detailed uh, knowledge of the company. Working hours, lower wages, no strikes, definitely that's uh, the, uh, their lower wages. Uh, do you still see Chinese companies are late movers? What we see, as we shown in this, uh, the, the a very aggressive last 10 years, and I would say last maybe five, six years. Five years yeah. yeah, exactly. What I said uh, five years. Um, okay, that's Africa and Middle East. When we compare data, uh, strangely enough, we found similar figures for Latin America and African investments. So like, uh, like uh, China is diversifying their investments abroad to balance investments in different regions, which is very interesting. So um, we are available, Anne and I, and Nicole uh, can uh, ha give the, we have here the, our emails. Please feel free to contact us, as we said, number one, because we want more, uh, more uh, chapters from other schools abroad talking about their own multinationals 
and also uh, any questions you have, please feel free to send us emails to both Anne and myself, and we'll be happy to answer. So thank you, Nicole, and the team at uh, Dan, and the team at uh, GBSN for organizing the, the webinar. And as, I, as we said, please feel free to contact us later on. Thank you so much, Lourdes and Anne. And um, any questions that we didn't get to today, I will send directly to both Lourdes and Anne, and they will be able to uh, answer those questions uh, via written format. All participants, as I mentioned, will receive the recording of today's webinar, as well as the PowerPoint and the written Q&A report, as well as uh, the contact information for both of our speakers. Um, and I'll just leave you with a final reminder. Next cross-border webinar is on Thursday, April 16th on uh, locking in jobs in a lockdown, coronavirus and careers for business graduates. My colleague Rob Vember will be leading that uh, webinar with a panel of speakers. Thank you so much again to Lourdes and Anne, and uh, we wish everyone a wonderful um, day. Please be safe out there. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole, and thank you to all for attending. Thank you very much.